Okay, so it's a couple of minutes past 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, this is it. I've got uh, Richard Castleberry, who is Director of IT Operations at Enterasis. Have I said that correctly? <laughs> Close enough, Enterasis. Enterasis, perfect. Okay, Richard, as a, an intro, can you please give us a little bit of background about yourself and what Enterasis uh, does? Sure, that's actually a, a great segue. Uh, Enterasis actually builds... Uh, switching routing networking products, so comparable to a Cisco or uh, Juniper or HP. Uh, we used to be Cabletron many years ago, if you people are familiar with, uh, with that name, uh, going back to probably mid-80s. Um, and in 2001, we uh, spun out and uh, focused really on enterprise. So we think enterprise networking, that's really where Enteris displays. Okay, uh, which I am I the director of IT infrastructure and operations. I have been here actually 19 out of 23 years. So I've uh, been here a long time, pretty familiar with the company, um, and wanted to share with you guys a little bit about Enterasis, not too much, because what we really want to talk about was how we choose cloud providers and the methodology that we use. 100%. So let's just get straight into it, Richard. Do you want to just pull up the, uh, the presentation and, and, and go for it? Sure. Okay. So we kind of covered this a little bit. So let's talk about why Enterasis. Let me do just five minutes on Enterasis and, and what we do. Now, you're probably looking at this slide, and you're probably scratching your head a little bit and going, we think Rich has the wrong slide because those people all look like Apple customers, not Enterasis customers. And there's a reason I show Apple. Apple, for, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with them, tends to have very loyal customers. Um, people will wait in line for days. You get this guy that etched the Apple logo into, the, into his head. Um, I don't have enough hair, so I couldn't do that even if I wanted to. But the point is Apple has very loyal customers. And the reason I show that, Apple uses something called a Net Promoter Score. It's a pretty industry-wide um, way to judge how loyal your customers are. And it's really the results of a one-question survey. And the question is, on a scale of 0 to 10, how likely are you to recommend this, this uh, to a colleague or friend? Apple score is a 72. It's an outstanding net promoter score, and that shows because Apple has very loyal customers. The reason I show that, though, and Terrace actually has an 81 uh, net promoter score. The only company I know that has an 81 net promoter score is a, a company called Harley Davidson. Harley Davidson builds bikes. Um, people love their Harley Davidsons. I have actually seen people run into a burning building to save their Harley Davidson from flames. Now, I wouldn't recommend that with Enteris switches because they're usually mounted in the rack and it takes way too long to get the switch out of the rack. So um, as much as you, you know, people love our products, I do encourage you to leave them in event of a fire. Um, and one of the things that we really focus on is customers and, and customer support. Uh, because of that, we've actually been the fastest growing network provider in the industry. Um, and that's something we're very proud of. We think it really comes back, not just having great products, but really having outstanding support. Um, now this is a little bit about our IT systems. We are pretty focused on cloud. So if you look at these, these are all of our key IT systems. The ones in the cloud shape, not surprisingly, are hosted in the cloud. So you can see probably 70, 80 percent of our applications are actually cloud applications. And when we say cloud, we really talk more about software as a service. So things like Salesforce.com, which obviously this week's getting a lot of press because they have their big conference this week, Dreamforce in San Francisco. Um, Google Apps, we actually uh, use Google. Also Google Mail and Google Docs and obviously Google Hangouts. Uh, we use Box, if you're familiar with that. It lets you store files in the cloud. We are actually migrating all of our file servers into Box. So from any device, anywhere, people can get access to what they need to get access to. I won't go through all of these, um, but there's a couple other cool names in there. Moxie Software for a knowledge base, uh, Job Science, Marketo is marketing automation, integrates with Salesforce, uh, Good Data for BI, um, Zinfi Steelwish, Channel Insight. The cool thing, and one of the things we really like about cloud, is it's very easy to bring new applications online. Um, most of these, probably eight of these applications, went online in, in a six-month period. Now, because we're so focused on cloud, um, one of the good things is we're able to focus more of our IT resources on adding new value. So if you look at most of the industry trends, Gartner says IT typically spends 70 to 80% of their time uh, on keeping things running. In terrorists, we're probably about 30 to 40%. Uh, 
Uh, and we attribute a lot of that to the fact that things are in the cloud. I don't have to patch Salesforce. I don't have to worry about upgrading good data. It all happens automatically. I don't have to worry about measuring um, uptime or making sure that redundancy is right because it's, frankly, somebody else's problem. But you've got to be careful when you go to cloud, too, right? And when, you know, one of the things we realized fairly early on, not all cloud vendors are created equally. So we ended up coming up with a uh, fairly complex spreadsheet that asks all of the questions that we uh, think you should ask your cloud providers. Uh, a lot of these are based on us, frankly, doing something and looking back and going, boy, we should have asked this. That was a very important question we forgot. Um, but essentially, we took all of the information that we've, that we've learned over the last couple of years, and we've been doing cloud since actually 2003. We were one of the very first Salesforce customers. Um, so obviously, that's you know, almost, uh, almost 10 years now we've been with Salesforce. So pretty comfortable with cloud. We've kind of gotten over the fear of cloud security. Um, and are kind of kind of all in. But what I wanted to do was share with you some of the uh, questions that we ask our cloud vendors, and then really open it up for questions. I think really um, getting feedback from people and uh, and answering questions is probably as important. So I'll probably spend the next 15 minutes going through our methodology. Um, I'll actually bring up a spreadsheet uh, that we use to rank one of our vendors, and it'll kind of give you the methodology and how we, the process we use to go through that. So what we came up with is something called the cloud score. Um, and if you're familiar with cloud, we kind of said, yeah, forget cloud. You know, that's great for people. But for vendors, you really want to know what their cloud score. And cloud stands for company, legal, openness, usability, and development. Now, clearly, I kind of chose those words on purpose because I wanted the cloud acronym. Um, but let's jump in and kind of kind of walk through what uh, what we mean by each one of those. So. Company is really kind of the first thing we look at. Is the company stable? Have they been around a long time? Uh, what's their support like? What's their disaster recovery like? Um, one thing we learned uh, with a particular vendor, just because they're in the cloud doesn't mean they're necessarily redundant. Um, we actually had one vendor who sounded great. It was a really cool product. Um, luckily, not a super critical application. Um, but when we drilled into it and started asking about where they ran it, it was a laptop hosted in the guy's living room. Huh. Now, the application wasn't real critical, and we're, we were still kind of OK with that level of redundancy. Um, but clearly, if it's a mission critical application, you want it on something a little bit more redundant than a, you know, a couple-year-old laptop in, in the guy's dining room table. Um, so we spent a lot of time asking about you know, disaster recovery and business continuity and what kind of hardware is involved, um, because we've learned that, that uh, not everybody pays as much attention to that as Amazon or Google or Salesforce does. And I think a lot of people assume or take for granted that everybody builds those sorts of redundant systems. Um, you know, the other thing we, we spend a fair amount of time on is company financials. If, you know, one of the great things with cloud companies is you don't need a lot of infrastructure, and it's very easy to bring new companies up and, and start using them. Uh, the bad thing is uh, it's also very easy to shut them down. People who start them aren't necessarily as invested as someone who's taken out three mortgages on their house and borrowed a lot of money from his friends and family. Um, so it's important to make sure that the company you invest in is going to be around for a long time. And we've been lucky. We have joined a lot of cloud vendors very early on in their, um, in their life. We started with Okta a couple of years ago. Okta is an identity and access management uh, cloud company. It does our single sign-on for us. It does account provisioning, deprovisioning. And it's a very cool company. Um, but three years ago, no one knew who they were, and I think we were either their first or second customer. Um, but we were comfortable with the management team. We were comfortable that their product worked well, and they had a, a good amount of funding to, uh, to keep them running for a while. Um, so we do recommend spending a lot of time on that. And then the other thing we spend time on under the company tab is really support. And Terrace just prides itself on support, and we hold our vendors to a, the same sort of regard um, in Terrasis, when you call our support line, you literally, the person that answers the phone has been with the company on average 10 years um, and immediately starts troubleshooting your problem. You don't get the, hi, my name is Bill, let me get your contract number, I'll have someone contact you in four to six hours. It's literally, okay, what kind of problem are you seeing and how can we help you? So we expect that sort of support from our vendors. Um, we don't always get it, but we do like to, as part of our proof of concept, uh, test their support, make sure that their uh, people answering the phone are knowledgeable, that we can actually get support. 
Um, one kind of gotcha we ran into early on, or fairly early on, was eight to five support isn't necessarily eight to five where you are. So if it's a German company and the support is eight to five, that probably doesn't mean the same as eight to five in San Francisco. Um, so make sure you ask that question and that you uh, you understand what the answers are. The other kind of gotcha that's tripped us up once or twice is companies that have to have named users for support. While I understand why our vendor would like that, uh, it's a little bit annoying when I have to call up and say, hi, my name is John, because I'm not one of the two named users for support. Um, so we do recommend kind of poking a little bit at that and asking that question. Uh, the next one we're going to talk about is legal. Legal is one of the one of the areas that's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, and I probably tend to be a little more sensitive um, to this than a lot of people are, because I've been stuck over the years with a lot of really bad contracts. So let's talk about contracts. One of the things um, lately that I've been spending a lot of time looking at is service level agreements. And one of the things, if you read the service level agreements, you'll find everybody has one, typically. Um, if you read the fine print, the penalty for missing their service level agreement usually reads something like, we will refund 3% of your monthly bill for every day that you don't have access to the service. Now, if you do that math, and I'm not a math major. My sister's a math teacher. She can probably do that math in her head way easier than I can. But 3% of your monthly bill is essentially one day. So for every day the service is down, they don't charge you for one day. Now, that's not really a penalty. That's just not paying you for what you didn't get anyway. Now, what I really try to encourage vendors to put in their, their service level agreements is a penalty that makes them want to fix the problem. Now, in some vendors, you can say, for every day it goes down, you will pay me $10,000. Pick a number. It could be $100,000. could be $5,000 but you want it to be a painful enough number that they don't want to have that happen. And then the catch is either you pay me the $10,000 or we come up with a remediation plan that we both agree to with milestones that show how you're going to fix the problem. At the end of the day, I don't want the $10,000. I want them to fix the problem. I want my CRM to be available all the time. I want to be able to place orders. I want to be able to market to customers. I want to be able to provide support. I don't care about the ten grand, but you have to give them enough pain that it's worth it for them to fix the problem. Um, you know, people talk a lot about compliance in the cloud, and there's a big fear out there that if you go to the cloud, you teach you got to worry about compliance, and the auditors are gonna are gonna have a nightmare with it. And the surprising thing is, it's actually the opposite. So this year, we've moved a lot of uh, a lot of applications to the cloud. Our auditors are actually in here this week. In fact, there are two doors down, um, so I need to be quieter than the auditor jokes, but. One of the things we realized was as long as your cloud vendor has what's called a, a SAS 70 Type 2 or an SSAE certification, largely it's all the vendors care about. Um, it becomes somebody else's problem as long as you have the right paperwork. A couple other things we look for. Um, if they get bought by a competitor, can we get out of the contract? If we get bought by somebody, does the contract transfer? Um, typically, it does with permission. Um, we also want to make sure that there's a maximum cap on increases. What I don't want is my Salesforce contract to go from $100,000 a year, I get it fully implemented, and then next year goes to $500,000. So we like to make sure that there's a, a maximum increase so we can budget appropriately. Um, we also like to make sure that uh, if the contract gets terminated, that there's enough time for us to move somewhere else. Um, not necessarily a cloud contract, but I had a data center contract that um, we were month to month on. They had to give us, as a contract said, not less than 45 days notice. Um, you can't move a data center in 45 days. Typically, it takes six months. Um, got a notice saying, hey, you know, thank you for being a, a data center customer with us. However, pursuant to section three, paragraph two, yeah, we're terminating your contract. You have 45 days to move your stuff. Um, that was not a good day for me. Um, we actually talked to the sales rep who said, uh, basically, I think I can get you guys to stay as long as you're willing to double your monthly rate and sign a two-year contract. Uh, we were planning on moving our data center in six months. There's no way I'm signing a two-year contract. There's no way I'm going for double, uh, double the rate. So we politely told them that we would be moving, and we spent uh, the next five weeks working 100-hour weeks and moved our data center in 35 days. Um, 
fairly painful. That's one of the things that I make sure is in the contract now. If it's going to take me 90 days to move, they need to give me 90 days notice to terminate. Um, the other gotcha that's burned me once or twice is auto renewal of contracts. While I like the idea of my contract automatically renewing, um, I only like it if it stays at the currently negotiated price. I've had uh, telecom contracts where the contract renewed automatically um, for a one-year term, which was great. Unfortunately, it was list price, which was about 130% higher than I had been paying. So um, make sure if it renews, that it renews for a reasonable price. Um, those are probably the, the big stories around contracts that have burned me. Um, depending on what the cloud vendor is, things like e-discovery can be really important. Um, for example, Box or Gmail, the ability to find a file um, for legal audits uh, or audits are very important um, for things like DynDNS, which does DNS service for us. It's really not applicable. There's no reason that somebody would want to see your DNS records, and frankly, they're public anyway. Um, but if it's something that you do have legal discovery for, you need to make sure it's in there um, and appropriate. And then um, the last thing we talked about was compliance. Again, as long as they have the proper certifications, compliance is largely a non-issue. Okay, the uh, next area I want to talk about is openness. And this is really, you know, when people, when people think cloud, they assume that all cloud vendors work well together, and that's not entirely true. <coughs> so a couple layers underneath here, transparency. Um, can you see when your cloud vendor is having a problem? So Salesforce, like I said, is one of our big cloud vendors. They have a site called trust.salesforce.com. You can go to trust.salesforce.com, and if they're having a database issue in North America, there'll be a yellow or a red icon that says, we're having a database issue in North America. Um, and I like that for two reasons. I like it because if the help desk has a problem, they can go to that site and say, Yep, it's a known issue. Salesforce is working on it. Or, no, nope, Salesforce says everything's working good. We should look somewhere else first. The other reason I like it, we have a saying around here that says, if it's measured, it's improved. Um, by Salesforce measuring how well they are and publicly making that available, the odds are pretty good that they're going to get better over time, not worse. So that transparency of how their operation works, I think, is really, uh, really important. Openness also comes back to, how open are they about sharing data? Can I get my data out of the system? Can I get a backup copy if I need one? Um, and then can I automate things? So I talked a little bit about Okta, which does our identity management. We can automatically create new accounts. We can automatically deprovision accounts, which makes life much easier when it comes to, uh, to new hires or, or people that get terminated. Um, and that's uh, an important piece of automation. You may also have automation if you're doing reporting. So for example, we take data from our SAP system. We export it using a product called Boomi into a host analytics tool that lets us do um, business intelligence reporting. That type of automation, that type of openness is something that's very important. And then lastly, types of authentication. So most cloud vendors will support something called SAML. Um, it's a pretty important standard if you want to do single sign-on. So in our case, Okta supports SAML. They support a couple other methods as well. Um, but any cloud vendor that uses SAML, I can automatically tie into Okta, and users can uh, sign on automatically. OK, the next tab is usability. And this is usability from a couple different perspectives. It's usability from um, how easy is it for me to get users to adopt it? What's the change management look like? You know, do they? provide free training resources? Um, do they help me with global training if I think I need it? Um, and then does it look like all of the other tools? Right? If, you're, if your users are very familiar with Office and you get something that looks entirely different, um, there's going to be more training and more questions and more headaches. So um, we take that into account. Not necessarily the deciding factor, but it is um, a factor. Um, administration is another area. We'd like to look at reporting and see you know, how, how much of users adopted it. Are they really using it? Um, and if not, we can focus on do we need to do more training? Uh, do we need to better market it? Stuff like that. Uh, also underneath that is delegated administration. So I don't necessarily want to give my entire IT staff 
um, full administrative rights, but it sure is nice if the help desk guys can reset someone's password or change permissions on a file um, so that delegated administration is important. Can I use things like Active Directory groups um, to automatically put people in the right profile? Um, things like that just make it a little more usable from an IT perspective. And then the last thing that people don't, um, don't talk too much about, and that's cloud performance. Um, obviously, cloud vendors don't want you to necessarily ask a question, but things that are not in your data center are obviously going to be a little bit slower than if they're in your data center. Now, the reality is most of the time it's not noticeable or it's not significant, um, but you need to test that. And I'm a big believer in doing a proof of concept, trying it from all of the different offices that are going to use it, um, me trying to use something from Boston, where I am, uh, is going to be an entirely different user experience than somebody in Beijing, China. So we ask questions around, do you support caching? Do you support global load balancing? Is there an offline version available? Um, if there's an offline version available, is it the same as the online version? Do I have to have two different applications? Do I have to do anything? Um, we used to be a Microsoft Outlook and Exchange shop. One of the great things with Exchange and Outlook, if you used cache mode, you never had to think about taking your system offline. You close the lid, you get on the airplane, you open it up, all of your email is there. Not all applications are like that, which causes problems for your users. So offline availability is important to ask. The next question is, does it work the same way, and do I need to do anything different to think about it? Um, the other thing we talk about here is WAN connections. Um, again, back to the, the cloud vendor that ran on a laptop. Not all of them sit on big fat internet pipes. It's important to ask that question and make sure that you, uh, you get the right answer. And then the other thing that's really important nowadays with um, bring your own device and consumerization, you, you know, does the vendor support multi devices um, and is that important to you? Salesforce, for example, it's great that they support an iPad app and an iPhone app because my sales team uses those devices um, and don't need to bring a laptop around with them. So uh, if it's something that's important to you, it's a great question to ask and then understand um, what their roadmap looks like around that. <clears throat> and then the last thing I want to talk about is really development. Um, so you know, do they have existing integration tools? Do they have an API? What's the development community look like? Um, you know, we like to see things like forums or Twitter hashtags or Google groups or some way for me to talk to my other peers uh, that are using it, understand what they're doing for development, understand what problems they run into, um, and share code and stuff like that. Tool sets is pretty important too. Um, not everybody develops everything in the same language or the same tool set. If I've got a group of .NET developers, but the cloud vendor only supports Ruby on Rails, um, you know, I have a I have a training issue, and I've got to make sure I can get the, the integration working between the two. Um, and then around that is, you know, can I get the expertise on it? When we first rolled out um, SharePoint in 2007, many years ago, we were one of the first customers to roll that out. We couldn't find anyone that knew SharePoint, um, and we ended up developing a lot of our own expertise. In the first six months or so, while well, Microsoft stepped up, was a little bit painful. So that's one of those questions we kind of make sh make sure we ask now: is you know what kind of expertise is out there, and if we need to hire a contractor, can we? And what's the rate? Um, and that helps make sure we ask, uh, you know, we weigh that appropriately. And then the other thing in development is really architecture. You know, a lot of cloud vendors, quote unquote cloud vendors. Um, aren't really the, uh, the multi-tenant SaaS type like Salesforce is. And I used to be kind of torn on whether I cared if a vendor was multi-tenant. Because really, the things I like about multi-tenant um, SaaS vendors are they can install once, and they don't have to install on 100 different systems. They force me to upgrade, um, which is good and bad. But I don't really care if they're multi-tenant, um, as long as they can do all those things. Now. At the end of the day, if they're not multi-tenant and they have to figure out installation on 100,000 different types of systems, they're clearly going to move slower. Their testing is not going to be as good, um, and they're going to cause problems. So multi-tenant is actually a uh, kind of come around. And I think that's actually fairly important. I do want to touch on the upgrades a little bit. Um, you know, historically, we were 
an in-house data center company and all of our applications are in-house. The thing we found was it was never a good time to upgrade, and so years would go by and would never upgrade. Our SAP instance was actually about 11 years old because every quarter we wanted to upgrade, either we didn't want to spend the money because it was fairly expensive, we didn't have IT resources because it was, again, fairly resource intensive to upgrade, or the business wasn't ready to test it. So literally a decade went by before we could take advantage of any new features. One of the great things with cloud is they force you to upgrade. Um, again, good and bad. If you're not quite ready and there's a real reason you can't, it's nice to have the ability to, to delay it for a month or two. Um, but what I don't want is the ability to delay that indefinitely. Not being able to have a choice uh, kind of forces the business to spend time to make sure that they're upgraded. Um, last thing I want to just kind of share, we actually made this spreadsheet available for everybody. So if you follow that uh, that Bitly link, that'll actually take you to the spreadsheet that we use. And I'm actually gonna gonna bring that up real quick and just kind of run through it and um, show you how to how to fill that out if you're interested. Bear with me one second while I switch gears. Okay, so what you should see now is a uh, cloud Richard, core. Can you, can, you, can, you, can you bring that up a little bit? I can, yep. Oop, that's not the right way. It's a little, bit more, um, a little bit more if possible. Um, uh, sure. Any better? Yes, a little, a little better. We'll see if it'll sharpen up. Okay, that's fine. Okay. <clears throat> so what we have is um, this first column is obviously the topic. The next column here are the weights. So one of the things that we realized was not wait. You know, you really need to weight these questions because things like redundancy and and recovery time objectives is really important for some applications, and you really don't care about others. Um, so the weight is a really a one to five. Um, we took some some uh, guesses of what we thought were important. Um, feel free to use it. Um, you can actually download the spreadsheet and use it any way you want. Um, if you do and you provide a score, I would actually love to get that back. Um, and I'll talk about that in a, in a couple of minutes as well. So again, a weight for each one of these, and then a score of one to five. And when you're done. Um, you get a grand, uh, total per line, and then at the end you get a grand total. Let's just go through these questions real quick. I think I covered all of these. Um, redundant sites, recovery time objective, recovery point objective. And we put notes in here as well to kind of give you some guidelines on what's a one versus one's a, what's a five. Um, one area I actually didn't cover too much under the under the company one. We actually are. I'm actually a personal believer that the relationship with the company is probably the most important thing. Um, so a company relationship, we actually rank fairly high, as well as references. Um, the tricky thing with references, we usually try to get our own, rather than letting the vendor provide them for us. Um, frankly, I have never done a vendor reference that wasn't great. Um, now, you can still get some useful information, but we like to find our peers that are using the application first, and then use them for references if we can. Um, influence. We tend to be a very early adopter, obviously, since we're, uh, we're probably 80% cloud right now. And it's important to us that we get that executive relationship and that we can help guide the future direction. Um, smaller the company, the easier that is. The smaller company, the more risk it is. Um, a little bit of a trade-off, but we're, uh, we've had good luck so far. We talked about coverage and contact type. Um, we do ask if they have a knowledge base. And then if they have the same knowledge base internally versus externally. Um, Microsoft has a pretty good external knowledge base, 
They have a phenomenal internal one that you can't get to. Having the same one, I think, is uh, is pretty important. Uh, legal, we talked about all this stuff. Um, I won't spend too much time on that. Um, openness, again, I think we covered most of this. Um, really, the key here is how tricky is it to migrate out, um, and can I get a backup copy of my data? Um, in some cases, migrating out is virtually impossible. Right? Switching from Salesforce would be fairly expensive and fairly tricky. Moving from Box to Dropbox would be um, would be fairly simple. The more commoditized it is, the, the harder it is, obviously, or the easier it is. <coughs> um, usability, I think we touched on all this stuff. Um, and then development, again, is really um, how, how easy is it to find people and to develop new stuff. Good. So, Richard, could, I think we, um, we're going to uh, just wrap it up. I'm just going to ask one question that came through. Who's your typical customer? And by that, I mean, um, I would assume they're meaning any particular vertical that you go after. Yeah, so Interesis does really well in um, education and healthcare. Okay. And part of the reason for that is one of the things that we can do that's pretty unique is we can actually get very granular. So on a single device, we can have multiple um, multiple roles. So for example, I could have a uh, student on one port. On the same port, I could have a teacher, and I could treat them entirely different. Um, so education, that's really important. For higher, that's pretty important. Um, the other place we're starting to have some pretty good success is actually in the data center for almost the exact same reason. So with the advent of virtualization, we can find pretty granular roles to servers. And then even though there might be 50 of them on one port, we can give them individual roles. So for example, on one uh, ESX host, we may have an SAP server, a web server, and a DHCP server. Uh, SAP should never start handing out uh, DHCP addresses, it should never start being a web server, so we can restrict it from that. Also, it's a very important application, so we can give it a high level quality of service, um, while the DHCP server probably doesn't need the same level quality of service, but has different, different security rules applied to it. The other thing is that will dynamically move, so when the virtual host moves to a different physical box, the network automatically configures itself. So any anywhere where that um, that granular roles is uh, is useful is uh, is really a good key spot for us, or okay. visibility. We do a great job with visibility as well. Okay, Richard, let me ask you like um, just a last question here. Do you are you following the uh, mega upload story in Kim dot com? Do you know that story? No, not yet. Okay, uh, mega upload is a you know a, a file sharing site um, in the cloud. And um, it's been shut down by the FBI uh, because uh, he was uh, this guy, this character called Kim.com, who's actually based out in New Zealand. Um, he's of German origin. Uh, was basically arrested under the orders of the FBI in New Zealand, um, basically because you know the sort of five major film studios were um, after him because. There was a lot of uh, copyright issues, a lot of files being uploaded to his file sharing site, um, and the big story right now is obviously you know there was a lot of uh, legitimate businesses who had stored uh, company files, company videos in this file sharing site, Mega Upload, who now have had their assets frozen, basically these 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 applications frozen uh, because Mega Upload has been frozen. So I guess you know the, the, the question is your thoughts on um, the risk, in essence, of trusting a, a, a file sh a file sharing site or a or a cloud storage site to, in essence, police itself um, to the degree that's required under the rule of law, um, and. Ultimately, you know, how can you protect yourself? I mean, if you're uploading files and you feel the company's doing box.com is, is, you know, should be doing a good job at taking down material that uh, shouldn't be up there, but ultimately they fall foul of that. I mean, what 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 recourse do you have to get your 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 assets back? Yeah. So so two things. Um, I actually highlighted two lines here. One of the two of the questions we asked really kind of revolve around that. There was a similar story. A number of years ago, the data center company down in Texas, who um, one of their customers had an FBI search warrant in, against them, and the FBI went in and said, "Hey, we want 
we want this company server, and they, for some reason, they didn't cooperate. And then the FBI went back a couple of days later with a search warrant that basically said, we're allowed to take anything in this building with a power cord. And they took everything in the building with a power cord. Um, now, obviously, that impacted a lot of other people who were innocent, but it kind of made the point that if the FBI asked you for something, um, you're probably better off to comply, unless there's a, you know, a real reason you can't, um, because they tend to win in the end, usually. Um, so we do, we do kind of ask, you know, do we get notified if there's an investigation against your company? Can our data be seized without our permission? Uh, and depending on what it is, that's, that's more important or not. Um, and then recoverability, can data be recovered without our knowledge or assistance? So in things like Google, Google actually says that they stripe your data across multiple data centers, and it's actually impossible for anybody at Google to recover it because of that striping. Um, logically, I'm assuming that also means the FBI can't recover it without our permission, so um, you know, I think we're probably okay there. But again, if it's that guy's laptop in his living room, um, you know, it's easy for the FBI to come in and seize it. So do you have do you have a clause in I mean do you add clause I mean what you you mentioned that uh, you'd request the vendor to uh, you know to notify you if they're under any form of investigation I mean is that a line item in your uh, service uh, um, in your agreement Yeah we usually try to put a, a contract clause in there that, that says hey you know if you guys are getting investigated or somebody else in that data center is getting investigated let us know Right um, we don't need to know the details, but we just want to know that there's a risk that, that something could go wrong. Um, and then the other thing we do look at, at is the ability to back up our data. Okay. Um, now for Box, I think we have two petabytes of data available that we can use in Box. I don't have space to back up two petabytes, but um, at least critical data we could uh, we could sync locally and, and be fairly good. Um, but that is an important thing, right? I mean, that's one of the one of the risks that you run into with, with cloud providers or any provider, really. I mean, the, the example I used was a, was a co-location uh, data center place. Um, I think the risks are out there, but I think they're probably fairly low. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, particularly when I think, particularly when uh, people, you know, a company will work with somebody like yourself who's vetted the vendor uh, and uh, gone through the various steps that you've outlined today. Um, you know, that expertise is invaluable. Um, Richard, we've gone uh, 40 minutes in here, so I'm going to wrap it up now. Um, I'd like to thank you very, very much for sharing all of this great information. Um, we've recorded this, so it's going to be live and available for replay. We'll send it out to um, the sign-ups or the registrants who weren't able to actually physically attend. Um, and um, you've got, there's a slide there with your contact information. Um, just like to thank you again, Richard. Yeah, great. Thank you for having me, and uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you, sir. Have a great rest of your day, Richard. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.